Good morning. Uh, this lecture is the first one of the second part. And uh, in the second part, we are going to study a number of computer control uh, strategies and how to design uh, controllers for systems interconnected with a controller. So we are going to use the models that we have studied in the first part to design controllers. Let me remind you a little bit, a number of things that are quite general to control. And uh, suppose that you have a feedback control loop. So your plant is supposed to be linear with a, uh, and for, the, for simplicity, let's consider this in continuous time, although I could replace uh, S by Z and the conclusions would be the same in discrete time. So suppose that your plant is modeled by the transfer function G of S and uh, we have two inputs to this G of S that I, I assume that they are, uh, they add one to each other, a manipulated input U and a disturbance input W. And I, I'm assuming that W is merely added to you. And I have an output Y. And uh, I have a controller, K of S. Okay, so uh, K of S is something that I design. And in uh, the framework of this course, K of S is something that corresponds to software. So the computer is corresponds to K of S and the physical part to G of S. And uh, what happens is that we have a sensor that measures the physical quantities Y. For instance, a position, if you are thinking about uh, the ro a robot or a moving vehicle, or a temperature, if you are considering a process or greenhouse or something. And so we have a sensor that transforms the physical variable Y into an electrical signal or if you pass it by a DA that I'm omitting all of that, uh, by a number to be given to our computer. And I'm modeling the sensor by just adding a noise signal V. V can mean many things, not necessarily white noise. Can be, it's the noise that affects the sensor. And uh, now I subtract my measure of the output from the reference, and I use this tracking error to, to excite my controller block of S to generate a manipulated variable. Okay, so this is a general feedback uh, control architecture. Uh, it could be made a little bit more general if you uh, would uh, filter R. Later we will discuss this a little bit more. But for the moment, let's assume that we have a simple feedback loop control. Now, if you apply the superposition principle, we have a system with uh, one output, Y, and inputs, W, the disturbance, V, the sensor noise, and R, the reference that you want Y to track. Okay? Immediately you see difficulty because V enters as a reference. So the sensor noise enters as a reference. So if uh, what you follow is a mix of the reference and the sensor noise. This means that if you want to uh, track the reference and not the sensor noise is because the frequency band where the reference is to be tracked, then there is no sensor noise. Typically, R uh, will, will be a low frequency signal, say, a constant or a sequence, sequence of steps like a square wave or something that slowly changes and the sensor noise V will be a high frequency signal. So we have these uh, three inputs V, W and R and one output and you can compute the transfer functions uh, relating each of the inputs to the output and then everything and you do this 
uh, using the superposition principle. So if you write these transfer functions, something that I'm not going to do, I, I did it already, uh, but if you have some difficulty, please let me know. Uh, then the output in closed loop in the transform domain is given by this. So we have one, two, three closed loop transfer functions. And uh, that filter, the reference, the disturbance, and the noise. Now, remember that I call kg the loop gain. And of course, if you want y to track r, kg must be very big, so that this is approximately one. And if a kg is very big, then uh, you are dividing this transfer function by a number which is very big. So you are attenuating w, but you are also tracking the noise. So as I said, the noise can only, uh, for the system to work, the noise can only act, may only act in the high frequency. So if you have a bad sensor, it won't work. The system won't work. Now, typically, the game is to uh, shape the loop gain, or that is to say, is to select the controller k such that the loop gain kj is something like this. So in the low frequency, you have a high value of the loop gain. In the India high frequency, you have a you, you have a low value of the loop gain. Then you must be careful with two other things. One is uncertainty in the plant model that puts another constraint here. And the other is stability. The uncertainty in the plant model, uh, I'm not going to discuss it in detail here, but uh, li it limits the bandwidth of the servo system, that is to say, it limits the bandwidth in which you can track the reference uh, for cases in which this uncertainty is in the high frequency. That's the realm of robust control that you have studied and probably forgotten in the first course on control. Now we also have the stability issue because uh, this shaping has to do with uh, performance, but when you cross the zero dB, you must not cross it faster than a certain rate, which is 20 dBs by decay, uh, because otherwise your closed loop system gets unstable. This is something that you have discussed in your basic course on control. Okay, so uh, again, this poses a constraint, and uh, you want this uh, fall to be sharp, but not so sharp that the closed loop system becomes unstable. No. These facts are general to all control systems. If you replace S by Z, you will, um, they, they will still be, be valid. And they apply to all of the, to all of the controllers that we are going to study. So, uh, if you have an integral controller, an integral controller, uh, in an integral controller, k is just one over s. So uh, if you replace s by j omega, the gain of the controller as a function of omega is just one divided by omega, because that's the modulus of one divided by j omega. If we take the modulus of one by j divided by j omega, it's just one divided by omega. So for at low frequencies, you have a very high gain. Actually, at the frequency zero, you have an infinite gain, and then it decays. So uh, one of the reasons for the PI controller, the proportional integral controller, to be very uh, popular is that uh, without people knowing that this has to happen, it happens. So you are forcing the loop gain to be something like this. 
And uh, the effect of the proportional effect is uh, to uh, create, uh, is to uh, limit, to create a zero that limits the rate of decay at the zero degrees and imp improve the stability margin. Okay? So this is a simple way, but do we want to have more uh, systematic methods to design our control. That's what we are going to do. Before I proceed, is there any question that you would like to make? Okay, let's go on. Okay, these are the main points that I, I have uh, told you. So you can uh, read the slide later, uh, just to remember what I told when you are reading, studying the stats. So the first method, the first method that we are going to study for feedback control is uh, state feedback control. So we assume that we have the state of a system available for measurement, and we are going to do the feedback not just of the output, but of the wall state. And we are going to see that under certain conditions, you can place the poles of the closed loop at arbitrary positions. So this means that under certain conditions that I'm going to state more precisely later, uh, if you feedback the state of a system, then you will be able to uh, select the controller gains such that the poles of the closed loop are in convenient positions. So you you specify your specifications in terms of the poles of the closed loop position. Of course, uh, they should be, they must be, they must be inside unit circle with uh, corresponding to a rate of decay of the temporal response that you specify. Okay? Of course, the faster the system, the higher the gains, but that's another story. So the first thing that we are going to study is how can we design state feedback controllers? And later uh, we say, well, but uh, to do state feedback control, I must uh, feedback the state. I must measure the state. And in many cases, the state is not available for measurement. In particular, the state can be a, a mathematical entity with no physical reality, so it's impossible to measure. In some other cases, uh, for instance, a glass oven. A glass oven is the uh, image which is nearest to the image of uh, hell. A image much perto do inferno que podemos imaginar. Imagine uh, a lake made of molten stone. Okay, so the temperature is so high, more than 1500 uh, degrees, mais do que 1500 graus, actually more than, typically more than 1560 degrees, 1560 degrees, 1560 graus, normalmente, mais do que isso. So the temperature is so high that uh, the glass melts. The, the, the stone melts okay, to produce the glass. A temperature is so high that the rocha derrete to produce the vidro. So, in this case, it's impossible to measure the state. The state is made of the temperature inside the molten glass. Okay? So, there it's impossible to design a controller, to design a sensor that measures inside at the surface okay you can measure it using optical means by using a pyrometer but inside it's impossible so in this case it's technically impossible to measure the state uh, and there are, I, I could give you other situations in which it's not impossible but we don't have uh, enough budget to install the sensors so we have only a sensor for the output so we are going to study how to estimate the state, the state from the input, the output, and the plant model, and then use 
uh, instead of feeding back to control the in then to control the the plant instead of feeding back the state we feed back the estimate of the state okay that's nonlinear observers or no or oh, sorry state observers or state estimators and then we put everything together and use feedback from the state estimator and we are going to see that uh, when you feedback the state estimator under some conditions that are uh, amount to a good engineering practice uh, you can also place the poles of the closed loop system where you want so uh, bear in mind these three objectives first study state feedback then study uh, state estimation and then putting everything together okay let's see uh, how this works so uh, i start by mentioning uh, the so-called regulation problem you want to stabilize the system and bring uh, bring the output to zero now in many cases you say but i don't want to bring my output to zero i want to bring it to a reference Okay, uh, if the reference is constant, then you can uh, think of an equilibrium of the system around this constant. And your linear model is nothing more than an incremental model. Okay. And uh, making the state and the output equal to zero is nothing more than forcing the state to be at the equilibrium, returning to the equilibrium where you want it to be, okay? So uh, remember that these models are, linear models are usually models that relate increments of the input and the output around uh, some equilibrium point. Okay, so let's study the regulation problem. And uh, uh, my control, my admissible control laws, are uh, a feedback of the state so i have a vector which is a row vector of uh, gains of controller gains that i have to design i call it l and i do the internal product with the state so this is l1 x1 plus l2 x2 and so on okay i put a minus here this is a matter of convention because if i had not a minus here then the elements of l would have the reverse sign uh, but we usually put a minus here okay that's my way of writing the admissible control laws and our objective is to design l such that the dynamic matrix of the closed loop system has specified values let's see how this works suppose that we have this system okay in which h is a constant actually this corresponds to a double integrator so in continuous time one divided by s square so you integrate it twice okay uh, the double integrator uh, of course this is an example but a, a double integrator is for instance uh, the relation of a moving car is the simple model for a moving car in which you apply a force and uh, if you consider its position as the output you uh, differentiate it once you have the velocity you differentiate it twice and you get the acceleration and you equate the acceleration to the force that you are applying so if u is the force you integrate it once and you get the velocity you integrate it once again and you get the position <coughs> and it's a non-trivial system uh, you can think what does it happen if you feed back the output of a double integrator what is the type of response that you get can someone help tell tells me if we if you have in continuous time one divided by a square and i feed it back uh, i do a user feedback controller with just one gain okay 
And uh, what happens? Does it work? Does it not work? Where are the poles and what type of uh, response can we get from in time? The time response that we get. Can someone tell me? I repeat this in Portuguese. Uma parábola. Uh, what, you say a parábola. Who was uh, José Luís? Sim, sim. Ok, thank you, José Luís. Uh, José Luís says a parábola. You think of a parábola because you have a double integrator. But uh, where, where are the poles, José Luís? If you have, uh, you have initially, in, your, in, not in the uh, open loop, you have both poles at the origin. Then you feed it back. Where do the poles go? Remember the story of root locus? Or you can do some computation to... Yes, that's right. Uh, that's right. They are imaginary poles. Okay? So if you have two poles at the, imagine, uh, at the imaginary axis, a pair of complex conjugate poles at the imaginary axis, what is the type of response that you get for this system? Oscillatory. It's an oscillatory. Okay? So it's not a parabola, but it's a, an undamped oscillation. So uh, this, this um, system is a, a simple example uh, in which using a, a, a constant controller, uh, a constant feedback controller, so a, a feedback controller of the output, uh, which is nothing more than multiplying by a constant gain, then uh, you, you don't go too far because uh, you don't track a reference. The output starts oscillating and that's it without stopping. So let's see what we can do. And uh, you say, but this is in this quick time. Okay, this is the sampling of the double integrator. If you uh, go back and uh, you, uh, if you review the slides on sampling, you will find this model, okay? This is an approximation of the double integrator. And H is the sampling interval, okay? It gives you this. Now, I'm going to feed back the state. So my controller is simply, simple, a linear combination of states where the coefficients of the linear combinations are L1 and L2. Okay, and then I add this minus sign here, okay? So uh, when I express U in this way, I'm eliminating U in the state model, so I end up with another model, so these two coupled equations, actually, uh, they can be replaced by an equation just in X. I eliminate you. It's the state model for the closed loop system. And uh, what I want to do is to design L1 and L2 such that the characteristic polynomial of the closed loop is something that I specify. So I specify P1 and P2. And I want the poles at the closed loop to be the roots of this polynomial. Z squared plus P1Z plus P2. Okay? So that's my specifications. Okay. How can I select P1 and P2? Uh, for instance, what, what could be um, a good selection for poles? Could you, could you, select, could you suggest something? A simple selection for the closed loop poles, for the position of closed loop poles in, in discrete time. Any suggestion? Com uh, um pole duplo no semi uh, negativo. Ok. Uh, the suggestion is a double pole at the negative axis. What do you think? Do you, do you agree this is a good choice? Remember, we are in discrete time, in discrete time. So there is one first thing that we must ensure. What is the thing that we must ensure for to have stability? That the pole should be where? In discrete time. Inside the unit circle. Inside the unit circle. So the pole, if the poles are real, 
they must be in which interval? Between what and what? Minus one and one. Minus one and one. That's very good. Okay. So, and uh, José Luis suggested putting between minus one and zero, say at minus 0.8, for instance. Is this a good choice? Remember one thing. Suppose that you have one pole, okay, at minus eight. The response, the free response, the transient response associated to this pole is a power of the pole, okay? So you have minus eight up to k, okay? So if uh, you make uh, k equal to one, you get minus eight. If you make uh, k equal to two, you get Min uh, plus 0.64, eight squared with the minus sign. Uh, sorry, with two minus signs, that's a positive one. So minus eight, minus 0.8, plus 0.64, and then again minus and then plus. So you are oscillating. If your poles have a negative real part, you have this high frequency oscillation. The poles are real, but they oscillate. This is something that you don't see in a real in a continuous time okay so uh, negative poles negative poles even inside unit circle they are not a, uh, a good uh, place to to for for spe to to specify so uh, if you want to specify the poles don't place them in the real and the negative real axis because of this effect remember that the significance of a pole is that the time response is the pole up to k, is the power k of the pole. So if the pole is negative, you get minus, plus, minus, plus, minus, plus, okay? And you have a very fast oscillation. And you want to avoid the oscillations in the response, in the output response. So uh, probably uh, another choice would be what, if you rule out these ones? The same, but in the positive. That's right. So uh, real pole between zero and one. Okay. Say if the pole was at point eight, it would be point eight, point sixty four, and so on. Okay. Always positive. Now sometimes you want to uh, make the response a little bit faster. If if uh, I want to make a, a response faster. Instead of selecting point I suppose that I, I, I consider just real poles and I want to respond to make the response faster. So instead of point eight, what could be a possibility? There are infinite number of possibilities, but what could be the possibility? One possibility. Can, one, can you suggest me one possibility which is faster than having the, po the pole at point eight? Uh. Isn't it the closer it is to the origin, the faster That's the response? That's right, very good. So uh, closer to the origin, okay? The fastest you can have is to place them at the origin, and in which case the response is just one delay of one unit, okay? Uh, if you have uh, the pole at 0.4, it's much faster. If you want to have it slower, you select, say, 0.9 or 0.95 or something like that. Uh, now, you want to have a fast response. So the faster, the better. So place the poles at the origin. Uh, are you having, when you increase the speed of response of the closed loop that you are specifying, is there any problem that might appear that prevent you to make things uh, as fast as, as possible, so putting all the poles at the origin. Uh, not exactly. The, actually, there is an interplay with that, but it's uh, the gains. The gains, as we, we, we will see, they increase. When you make a system faster, your gains increase. That's 
that's uh, reasonable because if you want it to be faster in responding, you are going to enhance, to increase the excitation, and for that you need higher gains. And if you have higher gains, the gains can be so high that you can have saturations, and then our linear theory goes in pellets. Nossa se aumentarmos muito o ganho, podemos ter uma saturação, porque o sinal de entrada satura, fica muito grande, e a nossa teoria linear vai à vida, não é? Rebenta. Ok. Now, sometimes, but you could have all the poles at uh, the origin. In this case, you would reach the, if you could do it, if you have enough uh, control amplitude, so if your, it, your input does not saturate and uh, you are really able to put the desired poles at the origin, then the response is just one delay. So after, if it is a first order system, if it is a second order system, it's two delays and so on. If you have two poles or three poles, then you have uh, one unit delay, two units delay and so on. Now, this does not, uh, does not happen because this means that you reach the reference in a finite number of steps. In continuous time, in continuous time, uh, this does ne never happen because you, you approach the reference always asymptotically, but uh, in discrete time, you can select all the poles at the origin and you get uh, the, the output becomes equal to the reference in a number of steps, which is just a number of poles of the system, which is remarkable. So if you have a second order system, in two steps, you reach the, the reference. The price you, you are paying is that you are having very high gains. And very high gains means that you can have a saturation. Also, it also means that if you have a model dynamics, then you are exciting with some model dynamics and you can destroy stability. Okay, that's another story. Be careful with high gains in practice. Now, uh, sometimes you don't want to have uh, real poles. You want to have some oscillage, some uh, overshoot to make the system a little bit faster. Okay? But uh, you have to select this P1 and P2. And if we have some, uh, uh, some intuition about real poles, in this quick time, the intuition for uh, complex conjugate poles, of course, they must be inside the unit circle, but apart from that, it's very difficult. So one possibility is to say, okay, uh, suppose that my system is of second order. So in, for a second order system, I can specify the damping psi and the natural frequency omega n of a pair of poles in continuous time. So I'm going to select these poles as if they were a sampling of a continuous time pair of poles with a given sign, the given omega n. So I know that omega n affects the speed of response. The higher omega n, the faster the, faster the, the response. So large omega n means uh, smaller rising times, for instance, and psi affects the overshoot and the damping. Okay, so uh, small size means that you have a, a lot of oscillations and a lot of overshoot. And if you uh, appro approximate one and for values of psi bigger than one, you have no uh, oscillations. Actually. You don't have any more oscillations for psi bigger than uh, 0 0.7, 70, uh, 71, 707. Okay, so what we do, we select the psi and omega n, and then we translate our continuous poles to a discrete uh, time desired polynomial with p1 and p2 given by these two formulas. Okay, of course, you don't, you don't have to know these two formulas by memory. 
but it's important to know that they exist. Okay. How can we get these two formulas? It's just remember the zero order or the equivalent in discrete time of the continuous time uh, function. Okay. If your system is not second order, well, uh, if say is for instance third order, uh, impose a pair of poles according to these formulas, and the remaining pole is a it's a real pole, and you can make it faster than for instance this pair of poles, and so on. Okay, so if it is fifth order, uh, you impose uh, two poles at these positions, then two other poles at similar positions with different omega n, you know, possibly different sign. Then you do a lot of simulations to, be, to see what, what you want. So in this way, uh, you can select P1 and P2, okay? So after, after all of this, remember what was the problem that we were, we are studying. So I have my discrete time state model, and I have my controller, which is a linear combination of the states. And I want to select L1 and L2 such that uh, in closed loop, the characteristic polynomial is something that I specify. That specify P1 and P2. Okay? So let's compute, compute the dynamics of the closed loop. So I just replace U by L1, L2, X with a minus sign, okay? So this is nothing more than the, than the state equation, but you, with you replaced by the control law. And then, uh, okay, this is a column vector times a row vector. I do this multiplication that gives me a matrix. I add the two matrix, and this is the dynamics of the closed loop where x of k plus one now depends only on x of k. So the u disappeared because I uh, eliminated it using the controller, okay? And this dynamics depends on L1 and L2, okay? It is here, 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 and here. So I want to impose that the eigenvalues, remember that the eigenvalues of this matrix are the closed loop poles. Remember when we studied the, uh, the state model and the connections with the uh, discrete time uh, transfer function, the poles of the system are the eigenvalues of this matrix. Okay, so let's compute the eigenvalues of this matrix. So I write the characteristic polynomial, okay, and the characteristic polynomial of a matrix is zi minus the matrix, so you have z here and z here, and then you have all the other terms are minus the matrix, okay? Minus this matrix here, so I get minus one plus L1, H2, two, as in here and so on. And then I compute the determinant of zi minus a, which is given in this way. So this is nothing more than the determinant, okay? Now, this determinant is the characteristic polynomial of the closed loop as a function of L1 and L2. And I want it to be something like Z squared plus P1Z plus P2, okay? So I equate, I equate this to P1, this to P2, and I get this system of equations that I can now solve with respect to L1 and L2, okay? So if this system has a solution, then I use this solution as the gains L1 and L2, the values for the gains L1 and L2. They are a function of P1 and P2. Remember that these are numbers. H is also a number. You, you have to decide what is the uh, the sampling uh, interval. And um, uh, in this way, you can design your controller, imposing that your state feedback controller is the state feedback controller 
uh, yields closed loop poles at the desired positions. Okay. Let's see another example. Usually, uh, in a presential class, this would be done by you, but I will do it here. Suppose that I give you the state model. In numerical terms, it's this one here. Okay. So my state feedback controller is a linear combination of the states. So minus L1, X1 plus L2, X2. And I want to select to design L1 and L2 such that the poles of the closed loop system are 0.9 plus or minus J 0.1. Okay. So here I'm giving the poles, the design poles for the closed loop. So what is the strategy? The first thing is we obtain the state model of the closed loop system as a function of the controller gains. So you pick up your open loop model, you pick up your uh, control law, and you eliminate U between them. Then we write the characteristic polynomial of the closed loop system. Okay, so we pick up this. Uh, model of the closed loop system, the state model of the closed loop system, and we compute the characteristic equation or the characteristic polynomial of the uh, of its matrix. Okay, this is a this coefficients of this characteristic polynomial in closed loop are a function of L1 and L2. Now we write the desired characteristic polynomial. And this desired characteristic of polynomial has roots that are given by the specified poles. So uh, in the first example, I was uh, uh, somehow using some arguments to, to get the desired characteristic polynomial, the P1 and P2. Uh, in this example, I'm giving the poles. I'm giving the desired poles. So I have to write a polynomial in Z that has these poles, which is simple. Now, you equate the coefficients of both polynomials. So you have the characteristic polynomial as a function of L1 and L2. You have the desired characteristic polynomial, and you equate the coefficients of both polynomials. So let's do this. Let's call phi our matrix of dynamics in open loop. Uh, gamma, the matrix that multiplies, in this case, a vector, because we only have one input, the vector uh, that multiplies the inputs. And L is L1 and L2. So phi minus gamma L is nothing more than the dynamics in closed loop, okay? So your system is x of k plus one equal to this matrix times x of k. Now compute the closed loop characteristic polynomial, and you have to compute the determinant of zi minus the closed loop dynamics, the dynamic matrix, okay? So you have here this dynamic, so it's CI minus this dynamics, and then compute the determinant. And uh, if I did not make any mistake, it gives you this polynomial here. Now, you want to have uh, poles at 0.9 plus or minus uh, 0.1J, okay? And this corresponds to the desired characteristic polynomial. You see that? Uh, if you place here uh, one of the poles that you want, 0.9, say, plus 0.1j, what you get, the 0.9s cancel, and you get j times point, point 0.1 squared. Okay? So uh, point 0.1 squared is 0 0.01, and j squared is minus 1. Okay? Squared, and you get 1. And the same thing for, for the other. So they, they verify, they, it's minus one, so they, they cancel it out. So the, uh, the desired poles 
verify this polynomial. Okay. Now you write this uh, as a sum of powers of z multiplied by coefficients, and you have your desired characteristic polynomial. Now you you uh, equate the the coefficient of z in this closed loop characteristic polynomial with the coefficient of z in uh, the desired characteristic polynomial in the same for the coefficient of uh, z up to zero, so the independent coefficient, this one with this one, you equate them. And you get a system of equations in L1 and L2. Okay, so you uh, equate these two, the, you equate these two coefficients, the coefficients of these two polynomials, and you get this uh, system of equations, that's a, these first two lines, and you solve it. I hope that you know how to solve uh, a linear system of equations, and you get the values of L1 and L2. Any question? Okay, let's see the general case. Let's see the general case. So suppose that you have a system given by the state model, x of k plus one equal to phi, x of k plus gamma uk. And you assume, okay, you have an output equation, but I'm not going to use this output equation that gives you the output as a function of the state. So I'm going just to use the dynamic equation. And I assume that uh, I have access to, a, to the state. So my, uh, my uh, admissible control law is a state feedback where L is the vector of control and gains. So in a bot diagram, I'm assuming that I'm measuring the state X. I multiply by, I call it KC or L, whatever you want. And uh, I put a minus here and I generate U, okay? And nothing, nothing else comes here at this moment. Now, if I replace U given by this, uh, by this uh, feedback control law in the open loop equation, so I eliminate U, I replace it by minus LX, so I get phi x minus gamma L x, which is, which means that the closed loop satisfies this other model, which is x of k plus one is a matrix phi minus gamma L x of k. Okay, and now I design L such that the dynamic matrix of the closed loop system, which is phi minus gamma L as eigenvalues at the specified values, okay? So, if I want the poles to be at positions beta one, beta two, beta n, okay, where n is the order of the system, then my desired characteristic of polynomial is something that I call alpha c of z, and is given by z minus beta one, z minus beta two, etc., z minus beta one. When you have a pair of complex conjugate poles, you, you can have the, use the previous trick, trick, the trick of the previous examples to write it more easily. So uh, clearly, if Z is, for instance, made equal to beta one, this vanishes and shows that beta one, Z equal to beta one is the root of this polynomial. Okay. Now, uh, I must solve this equation. The characteristic polynomial of the closed loop system, which is given by zi, zi minus the dynamics of the closed loop system, is equal to the desired characteristic polynomial. So I equate the coefficients. That's one way of solving these equations. And I get equations for L. <coughs> Now, before we go on, any question? You may ask, what, what are the conditions such that 
the algebraic equation that comes from here as a solution. Okay, and the condition is <coughs> this one. Suppose that you build these. Well, this don't get confused with the output matrix. This is a calligraphic C, but I don't know how to write calligraphic letters in a word. So I have placed this capital C here. But what is important is this part. So you pick up gamma. Gamma, remember, gamma is the vector that multiplies the input, and phi is the matrix that multiplies x. So I, I put gamma in the first column. Then I build, uh, I do this product, phi, gamma. Again, a vector, I put it here, and so on, up to phi, up to order of the plant minus one, gamma. So I have n columns, because it starts with phi up to zero, goes up to phi up to n minus one, and n rows. So this is a square matrix, okay? And uh, I compute the rank, the rank of this matrix. Okay, the rank, remember, in Portuguese is a characteristic of the matrix, see? And uh, the rank is the maximum number of columns or rows that are linearly independent. So I compute the rank. And if the rank is equal to the order of the plant, to the number of state variables, then you can always solve the problem of pole placement. So you can always uh, uh, solve the system of equation that allows you to compute the gains L1 and L2 and so on such that the closed loop poles can be placed wherever you want. Okay? There are problems in which this is not possible. And you, you can think uh, physically of one simple problem. Suppose that uh, you want to control the temperature of the main atrium of the main building of uh, the Institute Superior Technique. And so you install an air conditioner, okay? And uh, the air conditioner, which is your actuator, as a signal, which is your manipulated variable. But instead of installing the air conditioner in the atrium, where you want to manipulate the temperature, you put this air conditioner, say, at the North Tower. Okay, clearly, it's impossible to affect the temperature of the atrium of the main building with an air conditioner located at the north tower okay so if you write a state model for technical for the temperature in technical dividing the technical in parts and making energy balances and so on could be an interesting project uh, then you will end up with the conclusion that if you place your actuator in this position, then it would not be possible. This matrix would not be of rank n, where n is the order of, of the model that you want. Okay, why? Because the sensor is in a wrong position. Okay, now this is a almost anecdotic example, but there are many situations in which. Uh, it's not clear uh, that you find uh, that the, the, the actuator is in a bad position and uh, uh, but you have it in a bad position. But you, then you can rely on this mathematical criterion. So this rank condition of the so-called controllability matrix, this is a so-called controllability matrix, is something that tells you whether your control system has been well formulated. And if you have an adequate hardware to solve it, so it has a physical content. This mathematical condition, rank of the controllability condition matrix equal to the order of the system implies being able to design your controller, your state feedback controller. Uh, this is a mathematical criterion, but has a physical constraint, okay? <clears throat> Any question?
Okay, now, one way, one way to design your controller is by using that technique of evacuating the coefficients of the uh, closed loop characteristic polynomial and the desired characteristic polynomial. But uh, this uh, should be made uh, in a form that is more practical to use, in particular, that you can uh, easily program it uh, using MATLAB. So there are several formulas. I'm not going to deduce the formulas. Uh, one very popular is Ackermann's formula. So uh, according to Ackermann's formula, you don't have it to know it by memory, but you have, once again, to know that it exists. Uh, what you do, you compute the vector of controller gains as this is a vector which is 0, 0, 0, 0, 1. This is a row vector. Then you have the inverse of the controllability matrix. Okay? For the inv this inverse to exist, the controllability matrix must have rank n. Okay? So you can only compute the gains for uh, controllable systems. That is to say, for systems to, for which the controllability matrix has rank n. And then you multiply by this AC of phi. What is AC of phi? AC of z, AC of z is a polynomial, remember. Okay? AC of z is this polynomial. It's a polynomial of degree n. Now, uh, z is a scalar here, but uh, imagine that you have uh, replaced it by a matrix. Okay? And uh, replace each one of the betas by beta one times the identity. Okay, so that you, you can uh, subtract it from a matrix. And you do the matrix equal to phi. So you pick up the desired, uh, desired uh, characteristic polynomial and you replace z by phi. And the last term you have to add an identity matrix. Okay, so this is a sum of powers of the dynamic matrix phi. This dynamic matrix is the closed loop, uh, sorry, is the open loop, is the open loop, okay, this phi matrix. Now, if you do this product, you get the gains. Okay, I'm not going to prove it. The proof, it's not so difficult. Uh, actually, it's very elegant, but uh, it takes some time, and I'm not going to do it. In MATLAB, uh, this formula, you can pro program it, okay? but uh, it's already programmed. It's a function called Acker, okay? and uh, this function is works well for uh, systems with just really one input and one output of order less than 10. If you want to consider higher order systems and multivariable systems, there is another function which is place. Uh, the numerics of places are enhanced, uh, and they also, so basically, in this, either in Acker or in place, you can do the talk or help to see. Uh, what you do, you have to uh, provide phi, you have to provide gamma, so the state model, and you have to provide the vector of, uh, with the desired pulse. And uh, uh, these functions compute the vector of gains. So it's quite a practice to use. And in, in your uh, laboratory, uh, that is what you are going to, to do. Now, let me still tell you something that anticipates uh, one thing that I'm going to speak in the, it, it will be the, the last, uh, probably the last two lectures of this course, is uh, another way of looking at the desired poles. So you can have some intuition about the desired poles, but you can have, you can uh, have uh, optimization approach to the desired poles. So uh, one possibility is to select two gains, 
that minimize well, you know, multiplying by some factor, this is irrelevant. So have this one off is not essential. What is essential is this here, okay? So you have a sum of two terms. One term is uh, a sum of squares of x. So you have x transpose qx. Imagine that q is the identity matrix. So you have x transpose x is nothing more than the sum of squares of x's. Okay? If you have q and q is diagonal, then you are changing uh, weights uh, and you are distributing weights uh, with respect to the different components of the state. So uh, if you want to minimize the sum of squares of x, just look at this term, you want to minimize the power of x. You are summing from the initial time up to infinity. Okay? And uh, the system must be uh, stable for this to converge. Okay? Actually, uh, if you select the gains in this way, minimizing this quantity, you will always have a stabilizing controller. And uh, uh, you can say, I want my state to be well behaved. So I want to squeeze my state, not to, to, to drive it to zero. Okay, remember that we want, uh, we want the state to go to zero. Uh, started from some initial condition due to some disturbance and you want to return it to the, to the zero condition, that is to say to the equilibrium condition. Now, uh, we have R here, R is something, it's again a weight, and you have U squared. So this term tells you that U must be small, the power of U must be small, okay? Now you have a balance because uh, U is what allow you to act on X, and if U is small, probably X is big, okay? If you enlarge U, probably X, if you do it properly, then X will decrease. So you, you have a kind of water, water bed effect in which you uh, press in one side and pops out up in the other side. And if you uh, press it on the other side, then the first side it goes up, okay? So uh, there is a trade-off between uh, minimizing the power of X and minimizing the power of U. And this trade-off is R. I will tell you a little bit more about this R in a moment. Now, one possibility is that, remember, remember, let's look again at the model. Okay, I have Y equal to a matrix times X. I call it C, but uh, I'm sorry, I was lazy. I'm calling here H, so H is our C. So y is h x. Now, if I define this q to be h transposed h, x transposed q h is nothing more than x transposed h transposed h x. But this product of transposes is h x transposed. Remember that when we transpose a product, we have to uh, compute the transposes and change the order. Okay, but this is nothing more than y transposed, and this is y, okay? And they are scalars, so this is nothing more than y squared. So if you select q equal to h transposed h, then you are forcing y, the power of uh, to y to be small, okay? And the cost becomes in this form. So uh, here you are having a trade-off between having the output small, and u small, okay? Now, uh, later we will learn how to solve this problem. At this moment, uh, let me tell you just that MATLAB provides you, the control systems toolbox, provides a function which is called DLQR. Don't forget the D, because there is an LQR for continuous time, and the D is for discrete time, okay? So don't get confused. And if you give your 
phi your gamma, that is to say the matrices that uh, solve your problem. And if you give your Q and your R, then it computes uh, the gains. Okay? And the solution is nothing more than a feedback of the state. And this DL DLQR uh, computes the, this vector of states. Okay? Now, let me let me uh, tell you something about the choice of this weight R. Okay, that's an engineering knob. You, you, you adjust it to shape the response. Uh, suppose that you change R. So I, I do this plot and I can look at the first term and at the second term. Now, if R is small, what happens is that this term is given more, uh, less importance because R is small. So this is less important. And uh, so it will allow your U to be bigger. And the sum of the power of the output must be small. Okay. Now, when we start increasing R, you are making a plumb fit, plumb, you are putting plumb, plumb shoes in your controller. Don't put sapat shoes in your controller. The U change has more difficulty to change. It, because it's forced not to move so much. So this term here is the energy that you are spending with your controller uh, since R is increased, so you are decreasing it. And the power of Y is increasing. Okay, so you have some something like this. Okay, increasing R makes your power of U decrease. So this, your signal U becomes with a smaller amplitude but the, the signal Y increases the amplitude, okay? Uh, now, sometimes you don't want your U to be uh, very active, so U to be very high, because it can destroy or reduce the useful life of your actuator. If you have a valve, it move, if it moves too much, then uh, the number of years it will operate will be reduced. So, uh, but what happens is that by giving a little bit, uh, a small increase, okay? In Portuguese, um chochozinho, dá um chochozinho there, and uh, the power of you decreases, and the power of Y degrades a little bit, but not much, okay? So probably this is a good compromise around here. Now, if you start increasing R, what happens? The system starts working to uh, close to open loop. And your system Y is operating as it should, as it wants to be in open loop. And uh, your gains are being reduced and your power of U is being reduced, okay? So increasing the weight R decreases the amplitude of U, which is good but increases the response of Y to disturbances, which is bad. You can think this, uh, you can think about these effects in terms of the frequency response. Now, when you increase R, when you increase R, you are making the system slower, okay? Because U is, is smaller, so the system takes more time to react and uh, uh, the system becomes slower with an increase in R, and this is bad. Okay. On the other way, you are cutting the closed loop frequency response. So the sensitivity to high frequency noise and modeling errors are reduced, and which is good. So uh, increasing R is a kind of uh, panic button when you have a real system and you increase R and uh, you stabilize the system. Now, uh, you must take this with a grain of salt. Think to my risk of ground salt. Because suppose that your system is open loop unstable, okay? If you increase R, uh, you may not stabilize the system. Actually, you do, but 
in practice, uh, if you uh, have a very, very, very large R, then your system would, uh, your input would be very, very small. But if U is close to zero, then the system is open loop unstable and Y gets wild, changes a lot, close to instability. Okay, so be careful with open loop unstable systems. So uh, there is a range of values that depend on the system. These are general, just general rules. And of course, you need, you need to do a lot of uh, simulations to uh, see what is the best choice of R for your system. Sometimes we plot this uh, diagram like this. We do a number of experiments and we record the data not up to infinity, but up to some value. And we have an estimate of this infinite uh, horizon powers for U and Y and we do a plot and then we say, okay, R, the best one is this compromise here. So uh, this concludes what I wanted to say about uh, control, at least when we have access to the state. Uh, I would like to know if there are some questions.